conversation on we're gonna have a wonderful conversation on Cecilia. So we're gonna start off and let Father Michael open us with prayer. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Lord, we thank you for giving us so many ways to worship you, so many forms of liturgy and so many signs and wonders we share in being God's people. Today we have a lady, a holy lady who represented African-Americans in this Catholic faith. And today we are still praying for her sainthood we ask that the good Lord will give us the vision, the wisdom, the joy in carrying out this discussion in sharing and in being enriched by sharing in this woman's life. We thank God for all the wonderful people that God has given to us, especially those who make time out to share and to discuss matters regarding our faith. May God continue to bless us and invigorate us. May God continue to give his wisdom to Kathleen, who goes out of our way to bring us together and to make us share this time in history and create history by what we do. May God bless us all in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Deacon Leonard is going to take a pause for the calls because this is Respect Life Month. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you, Father Michael, for that wonderful prayer to get us started. Um, <clears throat> Kathleen asked me to just uh, sort of spend just a little time about um, the, the fix we find ourselves in, in Pro-Life Month, Respect for Life Month. And I'll just be very brief, but <clears throat> I've always said that this fight uh, with pro-life is really a fight for morality. And I, I beckon this down to just the basics. You know, we have, we have the Ten Commandments that talk to us about how we have to be in connection with each other through morality through family life, that we are interacting with ourselves religiously and socially in a way of respect, respect for the gift of life that we've all received at the time of our birth, and that our birth, all births, that the death penalty, that unequal health care, and unequal imprisonment tears at the very soul of what morality is. And so you can go into a lot of different areas of respect life, pro-life. You can have your opinion. My opinion is that it is a fight for the moral integrity of our lives. It just comes down to that. You can put whatever wrapping you want around it as though there's a difference between how people come to this earth, but it is all about morality once we get here. There were two things that impressed me as I was developing into my diaconate program in Atlanta. I got involved with uh, a couple of operations. One was called the Pregnancy Aid Center, but the other one was called 40 Days for Life. 40 Days for Life is a program that started down in Texas and it had to do with the rampant availability of uh, abortion clinics in Texas. 40 Days of Life comes about twice a year. It comes in front of Thanksgiving, as we move into the season of Thanksgiving and then into Christmas, it comes at the beginning of Holy Week as we move from uh, the time of Lent into the beginning of Holy Week. 
And it's a time where those of us who have participated in 40 days of life really work toward reminding our surroundings and our people and our churches and our communities that life is precious. Life is, is sacred and life is to be protected on all levels. And the other experience that I had was that this 40 days of life program drove me to become involved in something called the pregnancy aid clinic. It was an effort on the part of Catholics to gather, to pray, and to gain support of respecting life. And I started out as just uh, reading scripture to the families that would come. And then it progressed to being asked to be on the board. And so I was on the board of this uh, organization for four years and we began to expand our reach. The reach was all intended to help families. And when I say families, I don't mean just the women, I mean the women and the men who were struggling with their decisions about bringing life to themselves through the birth of new babies. And that was such a moving experience for me and for my wife, because we saw then for real, this tr the trouble and the struggles that so many families go through. But when you boiled it all down to why they were there and what we could do to help them while they were there, came back to one word, and that word was morality. And so in a very brief way, I'd like to say, pro-life and morality are the same. And anybody that argues or disagrees with you is arguing against the tenets of the Ten Commandments that we all live by. And so that would be my message today as we go forward, we will hear a lot about politics over the next few months. Even our own state is in the throes of trying to rewrite legislation. But it is not about legislation. It is about our morals. And so with that, I'll say in the name of our Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, let's go forward with the joy of life. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Deacon. Thank you. And um, if you go to the USCC webpage and also the diocesan uh, website and look at our pro-life information and resources, if you want to do something in your meetings or in your parish in recognition of October being Respect Life Month. Okay. Now, uh, weekend ahead, Sister Pam couldn't be with us, so I will be the weather girl. Here we go. It's looking good, folks. Um, in Columbia this weekend, it's going to be in highest of 83 today, but it gets down to 56 tonight. As you can see, tomorrow, you all are going to have 76 degrees, which is very, very nice, 51 at night, and Sunday, 74 and 60 at night. Now, folks, this is sweater weather, sweater weather, wear your sweaters, and don't be caught without a sweater or jacket at night because you will freeze to death. You won't freeze to death, but you're going to be quite cold. Okay, so let's dress appropriately. In beautiful Greenville, South Carolina, um, today we're going to get a high of 83 and the lower 58. Saturday, 75, lower 52. And Sunday, Sunday, which is our parish picnic day. Woo, woo, woo. Y'all want to see some pictures? I'll send some pictures. I'll post them on our Facebook page so you'll get to see how we do it up here in the upstate. Um, we're going to have 70 degrees out there while we're having our picnic. And the lowest is going to be 53. In Charleston, Charleston, my favorite city. And I hope that things are coming together after Ion. Um, I think you got floods. It wasn't as bad as anticipated. However, um, those prayers came your way. So today, they're going to get a high of 80s, floor 63. Saturday, the little clouds are going to come in. But the chance of rain is very slim. Um, high of 78, the lower 62. Sunday, 75, the lower 66. I'm not quite sure if you need anything heavy down there all day. It's going to be very, very nice. Probably a sweater at night or a jacket will carry you through. And as you can see, I'm in there. The 77% chance of rain is for Sunday. 
just like a, a monthly shop. Okay, and um, I hear someone's in the background there, but um, that's okay. Hurricane Ian evacuates, return to mud, rubble, as death toll hits 101. Please continue to pray for those that were devastated by the storm of Ian. Death toll hits 101. Okay. Now, before we start our, our chat, I just want to give you an update on something that is so important for us. The National Black Catholic Congress 13, Diocesan Day of Reflection, is Saturday, November the 5th. 10 a.m. to 12 noon. Right now I have it scheduled Zoom, but it may be live. We may do two. We may do one Zoom and then one live. Um, and I will keep you all updated, but you can mark that date for one of them. If you plan on going to Congress, you must attend a day of reflection, okay? Um, after November 5th, there will not be any day of reflection simply because we have to get our report into Congress. And our report and all that we do up until Congress is going to lead to the formation of our pastoral plan for the evangelization of Black Catholics. It is a national plan, and, and most of you who are um, familiar with the Congress, you know that that is what we take and pass it down to our parishes, and that's how we evangelize in the new, okay, or th those are our um, primary goals and the way that we try to achieve those goals. So it's very, very helpful. And that input comes from everybody across the whole United States, including our bishops. Our bishop has been invited to come along and I, um, I will keep encouraging and Father Michael will keep encouraging that we go with our bishop. All delegates must attend the day of reflection, registration scholarships available for 22 delegates. Our bishop has a lot of funds for us to be able to pay the registration fee. And that registration fee is something like 300 and something dollars, I think. And um, I will send a letter out to our historically African-American parishes and probably in Caritas to all the parishes that um, if they are sending someone to please help them financially because you know it can be quite expensive okay um here you go um it's going to be at the Gaylord National Resort Convention Center July 20th through 23rd mark your calendars and um they will open registration mid-October which is you know not too far away um, keep checking the home page pop up in this section for updates. Um, we will probably, I will probably send things out and help to facilitate getting our delegates in line. Uh, so um, if you want to go ahead and register yourself, you can. And um, just let me know. Um, Congress 13 registration and Gaelic National Hotel registration have not been open yet. Please check back here often and I'll keep an eye on all of that for us. Um, adults for adults 19 and up. So um, your registration fee is $395, okay? That's early bird. That's early bird. So we're going to get everybody to register before February 28th, okay, folks? The regular registration is $450 starting March the 1st, okay? Now, we're not going to pay the $450, okay? All the, all the um, scholarships from the diocese is gonna be at the $395 level, okay? Keep that in mind. And then if you just walk in on site registration is $495. How much early bird youth is $350. And um, some of the um, delegates would definitely be youth. So I encourage families to bring their youth, you know, and give me a call so we can work all that out. Uh, not, um, if you want to do a youth group, you know, call me, we can work that out too. Uh, but, you know, youth will have to be um, carefully monitored and need to come with parents for a youth group. And there'll be forms, okay? Um, room rate is $247.94 a night, okay? And if you can see this place here, I think the room's gonna be quite nice. It looks really interesting. Okay, so there you go. And I will keep reminding you all and updating you all on everything that I get so that um, our 
participation and our delegation is ready to go. Amen. Now, while you all are here, we are going to start our dialogue. Um, this video that you all watch, and if you didn't watch it, that's okay too. You can still join in, Going Home Like a Shooting Star, Thea Bowman's Journey to Sainthood. It first began in where we were advocating um, the television station to play it because it was made for TV. And um, they began to play it. And the time that they would allot it was like 2 a.m. in the morning. In fact, in I think Columbia, uh, Dr. Allison Malechi posted that um, she received an, a message and also uh, Deacon uh, Leonard Shambliss um, sent me a recording of where the station uh, manager uh, ha had responded and said that they will play it. What's that date, Deacon? Deacon Leonard. Okay, he stepped away. We can ask him later. But anyway, um, we are going to begin our discussion. And I would like for Father Michael to start. And I'm going to bring everybody up to the um, presenters level so that you can easily talk. I will ask you to unmute, I mean, to unmute, mute yourself and unmute when you get ready to talk. That way we don't have to worry about a lot of background noise. You know, like your dog barking and the phone ringing and you talking to someone else in another room. Um, that will help us to have a really good session. Good session. Father Michael, you wanna start? Okay, Father Michael is not responding. Hello. Hi, hi Father. Hi, um, thank you guys. I am really glad to be part of this discussion. Um, I don't see my picture, uh, it doesn't matter. I, I think it's because I'm using the phone, but um, the talk about this lady is first of all important for us to know who she is, and important. And I guess some of us are who met or have seen her, we are blessed and joyful to be able to know someone like her and to, first of all, begin to look at a lady who brought us to light by her vivacious act of faith. It's also very important that she is one like us and that embraced faith at a very young age and was not ashamed at any point. The first thing you will notice about this woman is that she's so pretty, she is so gifted, and she was ready to, to give what she has for, for, for the growth of faith. One thing that is so outstanding about her is the music, love of music, how music could be used as a tool of faith in expressing joy. And, um, and it takes her back to her roots. She always talks about how her roots, in Af great in African-American community and great in Af African-American family, gave her this love for music and to use music. But then she's also a very specially gifted, talented, intelligent woman. Uh, what comes to my mind whenever I think about Tia Woman is, it sounds like it's a, a sexist or feminist, but it was it is for an appreciation for women in our lives, appreciation for uh, the way the strong women that uh, we have seen. This woman is laughing to the Congress, singing to the to, to the Congress, you know, penetrating the minds of leaders who are mainly men. And so you see her as she is, you know, just like a rocket and um, going through all suppressions sometimes. And but one thing is her voice cannot be crushed. Her voice is out there. 
So her sainthood is, is a gift to the church and to all of us. And also she calls us to be outstanding, you know, like some parishes where music has died or is dying to maybe that is the reason why we are not flourishing in our faith because we have not uh, projected um, we have not projected um, what you call it um, we have not projected music and then inculcated music and in, introduced music and the, the, to touch the soul we are, we are not growing in our faith because we, it is not soul field. It is not soul field. If it is soul field, then we know because this is a soul field uh, uh, adventure. There's no way you can love God and express faith without coming from your soul. And this is what we have as African Americans and Africans. Our basis of life is soul. You know, it gets to the bottom of our life and uh, faith will make impacts when it comes from the soul. And how can you touch the soul without music? So my dear ones, as we discuss this lady, let it be a challenge to all of us who want to come to mass and go and not feel the, the, the strength of the, the soul, connection of the soul. Let it be a challenge to all of us because this is where I see this woman so prominent, prominent that he says, you know what? This is our life. And um, this is how we can touch God and reach God. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Father. Um, I thought that the movie was put together extraordinarily well. I was just blown away. I've watched it twice. And um, I took notes last night. She was remarkable. And she was really a walking saint. And I just can't wait for her um, to become officially a saint. Um, the arts, she used the arts to get her message across, all forms of the arts. I love it when she, um, she went through this transition within herself, you know, going into the sisterhood, she changed. And um, then at her 25th Jubilee, as a sister, she went to Wisconsin to celebrate with the Franciscan sisters and she wore a black habit. Then a couple of weeks later, she went back to celebrate again and she had, she had made a transformation. She had on all of this Afrocentric, beautiful stuff. Her whole life had just transformed into who she was supposed to be as a black sister. And it was, it was remarkable. Look at you, Sister Roberta, you remember that, don't you? I'm mute. You, I, that just like blew me away in the movie. You can talk, sister. I'm mute. Thank you for having me. Uh, many of you know that I knew Sister Tina personally. And um, uh, she was a member of the National Black Sisters Conference. And I used to attend conferences with her. And she was a joy, uh, a, a real joy. Um, uh, I, I invited her first to South Carolina and I know other people did after that. But one thing I remember um, when I watched the movie and like Kathleen, I've seen it several times. I seen, saw it when it was the trailer view. And um, she, I remember going to the Columbia airport to pick her up. And when I got to the airport, she was dressed in her, um, she was dressed more like uh, someone who would have been a, a cotton picker. She wanted to go back to the roots of our people. And as she came through the gate and she saw me, and I don't know, I must have come right from school or something. She said to me, you are the daughter my mother always wanted. And so in the movie, even if you saw, I, I think she meant in terms of uh, I was dressed like a lady and Thea was, you know, like often uh, kind of uh, tomboyish and her mother was quite the, the lady, her dad was the, the doctor. But the one thing that really impressed me about Thea was her, I think Father Michael said it, her, her, her faith, her love of God. And when she sang that song, um, done made my vows to the Lord and I won't turn back, I shall go to see what the end would be. That's how she lived her life. 
and now kind of last two things, um, and I'll chime in later, but when she got sick, I used to call her every week and um, she would always answer. She would always talk. She was joyful, 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 joyful. And when we had our conference in uh, Mississippi, I think it was a joy, all of us from the Joint Black Conference, we went on buses to visit her home. We went out to see her there. We took sandwiches and we sat on the lawn, some in the house. We took turns going to visit her in her bedroom and saying goodbye. She was so joyful. And the highlight of all of that was Sister Thea. I attended her funeral. And when I saw the, the video and it showed the funeral there and Father uh, John Ford uh, preaching, he was a dear friend to her. In many of those um, photos, you saw her with a priest and probably he was incited, but um, a, a, B. Abrams, he used to teach with her at Xavier and they did everything together. Uh, B. Abrams is buried here in Buffalo. He was a Franciscan um, priest. And, but Thea lived the life. She lived the faith and she magnified people and excited people with the joy of what it meant to be a consecrated sister. Indeed she was, and as uh, Addie said, she was a black sister and she was proud of that. So thank you. Right, thank you. And you all raise your hand if you wanna chime in. Um, one part that stood out for me again was when she had to explain herself about preaching because women couldn't preach and nuns couldn't preach. And she said, I don't preach. She says, I don't have to be an ordained priest to do what I do. She knew that there was a room, room for men to preach. And she just wanted to clear that up. And she kept doing what she was doing. She said, I'm not going to stop. Come on, y'all, raise your hands. Y'all know y'all dying to say something about it. My hand is up, Kathleen. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. Let me see. I see Edda and Arthur. Okay, we'll, we'll start. Edda. And then Arthur, you're next. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, I just like to say that um, Sister Thea um, visited St. Martin's many, many years ago, and I can't even remember how many years ago it was now. But it was like um, we had a revival type service there, and whenever you were in her presence, you could feel the spirit of, of her faith. Um, I feel so blessed that I was able to attend that service and to being with her when she prayed for us. And we had an old fashioned laying of hands ceremony where she did, she, you know, she prayed for us individually and laid her hands upon us. And um, just recalling that memory just fills me with so much faith and strength and hope. Thank you. Thank you, Ada. Arthur? Good morning. I, I may have joined a little bit late, but um, you know, one of the things that impressed me in the documentary was just her, her beginnings um, and her um, uh, certainly conversion to Catholicism and the fact and the impact of Catholic education. Um, it was that exposure that really got her um, in a position to ultimately demonstrate the um, saintliness, I guess, of who she was, obviously, from, from childhood, from the beginning. Um, so it was very impressive. It was also impressive um, uh, when, um, you know, she was told basically that she ought to, um, rather than going to the, uh, I think it was the Franciscan nuns, that she should go to one of the um, black order of nuns. And she said, no, she was certainly going to um, Wisconsin. And, 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 and when you look at the fact that she made that decision and ultimately the care that she needed later in life for both her parents and herself coming from uh, her colleague, her fellow sister, was also impressive. Just it, her, her whole life was just 
um, a story of what faithfulness means and remaining uh, faithful, but also as Kathleen, you said about her transition, you know, from just being a, um, a, 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 a sister in the tradition of um, European sisterhood to really um, uh, transitioning to her blackness and realizing the contributions that African-Americans um, brought to the church. And, you know, we always hear about her um, presentation to the bishops and the impact, but that documentary really drove home the, the real impact and how she um, got the, obviously she, her, what she demonstrated in, in speaking about the support, who the black bishops were, who were present at that bishops conference, but also bringing in the white bishops into a collective understanding of blackness within the church. So I, I, I'm like you, Kathleen, I was just blown away by the uh, documentary and um, just the, the, I think if there's anything that demonstrates, you know, why we support her um, canonization, last night for me brought it all together. I didn't, get, unlike some of you, I did not get to meet her um, and so that's one of the shortcomings in my life. But the fact is that I, I really grew, uh, gained a greater appreciation for who she was by virtue of the documentary. Amen. And um, she stood in front of the USCCB that last time, you know, before she died. And she told them, she said to, about the black bishop, she said, these black bishops are our bishops. You may have ordained them, but they're ours. They come from our communities. They are our voices. We train them. I love that. You know, sometimes I don't know if we give our Black bishops enough respect and honor that we should. I guess it's just not enough to give them, but they are, and they're doing a wonderful job. And she said that, what, in the 70s, perhaps? Is that right? In the 70s. It needs to be said again because it's hard. Even for Father Michael, Father Michael, you have a hard time being our voice at the table. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Catholic, we keep, we keep faith up. The faith is actually what holds us because I, I, I think about the video, I looked at it, I watched it, and I, what came to my mind is, how is this video going to be looked at, be seen? You know, because we have to reach to a certain level of conviction in order to watch where this video takes us. It's not for sensation. You have to look deep into it, even in the sense of historicity, in order to understand that this is a deep challenge. It is a deep challenge. And it goes a long way to talk about why we do not have Black sense. How come we are not contributing money or doing whatever we need to do to get these people to the top. When we get these people to the top, then what she has said has really resonated to our time. So I, I, I hear you, Kathleen, it's so hard to get to the table. If you don't get to the table, how can you talk to the table? If you are not at the table, you are the discussion. So we need to <laughs> for somehow get ourselves to the table and be able to be heard. And this woman was heard. So we need to use our voices from, you know, that's why we really need to connect together as, as a people so that we can be heard. You know, yeah. 35 years, 40 years after this woman has addressed the Congress, the question is, are we still, are we being heard? We are scattered. Look at the diocese, people, African-Americans who are in, other parishes don't want to be to come out so that they will join force so that we can be a people. We are scattered. So we really need to get our voices together and talk as a unit. You don't have to be in St. Martin de Porres or in St. Patrick's, which is now almost going to something else, or St. Anthony of Padua. Even those who are in St. Peter's, how many of them identify with this voice? You know. 
So we really need to connect our people. It's not about location. It's about being the people. You know, it's not about where you are. It's about who you are. I stop. That's right. Um, she told those bishops that were present. She said, every time you have a meeting, look around and see who is missing from the table and send someone out to get them and invite them to the table. Then, and only then, can we truly be church? Can I get an amen? Amen. 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 <laughs> That's what she said back in the 70s, okay? Um, when I came aboard 20 years ago, um, I didn't know quite what I was doing, but this was on a Bishop Baker. And I went through the files of Black Catholics and all the letters and all the meetings. They said they wanted a voice at the table. They wanted a Black person on the Bishop's Curia. Letters and letters. I came in on the Bishop's Curia. During that reign, we did not close one church, one school in our African-American communities. Remember that, folks? Sure. Not one. And the bishop made a promise. He said, I will not close them. After that, they began closing again. Well, Kathleen? Yes. You know, with respect to her appearance before the uh, conference, you know, for, for someone who is not a bishop um, to speak before the conference probably was in historic, especially a woman, was probably making history in and of itself. So the mere fact that she was a, 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 a religious and um, a black religious, and certainly um, at a time when I am sure that there had not been very many religious, if any, and I'd certainly like to know the answer to that, who had been invited to speak to uh, the conference um, was significant in and of itself and becomes a part of that overall history of why she is special um, because of the, not only her, her, what she said, but her, the mere fact that she was able to appear and speak so boldly um, to um, a conference made up of certainly 90, probably 98, 99% um, white bishops. And, and she also, in doing so, gave voice and support to black bishops who probably had not, had never said to their fellow bishops what she was able to say. And so once she laid it out, it gave them a stronger voice and position within the conference because then these white bishops had to look at their fellow black bishops really in a different way. I think, you know, the quote that you made, that you gave from her really laid that out. And um, I just, you know, we benefited certainly from, you know, her work with the, with Xavier and, um, uh, you know, brought, bringing the preaching style and the emphasis there um, to uh, the, 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 the uh, Catholic clergy um, was really significant. And we, we are beneficiaries of that to this very day. And so I just think that, um, you know, again, um, her canonization is really um, well documented um, in that piece. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, she was on 60 Minutes and gained national publicity, y'all. She became superstar. She said when she sees Black children, she wants them to say, Black is beautiful. And point to yourself when you say it. She made CBS Mike Wallace say, Black is beautiful. He was kind of hesitant. Did y'all see that part? Mm -hmm. Harry Belafonte saw this and knew he wanted to do a documentary with her. He was going to do a movie. And guess who he wanted to play? Sister Thea. Don't y'all remember? Oprah. No, Whoopi Goldberg. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you remember Etta, you're laughing. Yes, mm -hmm. it was in the documentary. And um, so Whoopi drove up to meet Sister Thea. Mm -hmm. And um, this was her companion that took her around telling this story. So they watched this movie star come there, I guess to the convent. I don't know where she was. 
and she went out to get into the car and she said, what an ugly car. <laughs> and Whoopi said, it's a Porsche. And Thea responded, what an ugly car. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was so funny. Now, Harry Belafonte is dead. I bet if he was alive today, he would have made that movie happen. And I would not be surprised if just this documentary here that they did prompts someone to do a motion picture on the screen. This is just, I was just blown away, y'all. I could talk all day. You know, Kathleen, I wanted to uh, speak to something Arthur said. And um, if you notice who was on the stage with Sister Thea. It was Bishop Ricard. He was there. He was one of the people. And Bishop Ricard and some of those earlier bishops, um, you saw Marino up there too, that they were the ones that really stepped out in faith to bring to the conference of the bishops um, our agenda, if I might use it in that way, in terms of being at the table. Uh, the Black bishops, uh, I was happy to hear someone speaking about that, that they need us because um, in many ways we criticize them. Um, I was recently at a conference with Bishop Braxton and um, he has recently retired. Some people shy away from him because they say he's just a, a, a heady theologian, but underneath it, a lot of wisdom. But Thea, um, it, I, I think what, I want to say that when she received the flowers, the roses, and she said, I accept these roses on behalf of all the mothers and the grandmothers and the mothers, the mothers who in the name of their children and in the name of the church kept the faith. And, and that's how she lived, you know? And even when, you know, she, uh, she had a humor to her. I remember when um, they are, uh, to become a saint is quite a, a process. And uh, I was asked to do um, an interview about her life. And at first I saw the, the little booklet and it was over 200 questions. And they told us that it would be probably a four hour um, process. And it's like being in a court and you have to uh, put your hand on the Bible and swear that whatever you're saying is true and all of that. But, you know, like Thea said, when they were at her coffin there, she wanted to be buried in the simplest of the simplest. And that's how her life was. She said, don't put that money on me, give it to help support a, a school, a black Catholic school. And I think it's a reminder to us these days when father was saying about how we are divided in so many ways. You know, we've been through that period of I'm Catholic, and I don't wanna have anything to do with this being a black Catholic. Some of us still struggle with that. That's why to me, the Congress is so important. Back with Daniel Rudd, Daniel Rudd, the Congress was one of his ways to be at the table, a lay person who started the Congress. And I think we need to, we need to keep being out there and, and, and speaking on behalf of our people and among ourselves to, to stop feeling that I'm, I'm a Catholic and this black Catholic stuff or this black Catholic music separates or divides us. It is doing what the Pope told us. Enrich us. Okay, sister, here's a question. Um, it was the highlight of her ministry was in 1989 when she addressed the USCCB on what it means to be black and Catholic. What did she say? She said, sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Absolutely. And, and you know, I reflected on that. And when you're out there and, and um, as I look across the board here of everyone there, we are all leaders in the church. We have voices and we have done a lot of things, been a lot of places and still going. Do we sometimes feel like a motherless child in the church? Who wants? Raise your little hand. Arthur, your hand is up. Do you just want to just continue to talk? All right, folks. You know you will have to engage. Okay, I'm just going to call on somebody. Mm -hmm. Jesse Bowens. Unmute. Unmute. Hello. Hello. 
Okay, we'll wait for her to unmute. Deborah Gordine, unmute. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Is everybody out? There you go. Hey, Deborah. Hey. Well, actually, Kathleen, I never feel like a motherless child. Never. Because from my perspective, as far as me as an individual person and how I feel as an individual person, I have always felt loved, loved by God, loved by my family, my own mother and father, and never really questioned, even in the struggles and discriminations and all of those kind of things, my value as a human being made in the image of God. And so God made me a black person. And um, I've, I've never felt motherless in the sense of, um, I've always known that I have, I haven't always been Catholic, so I haven't always looked at um, the Virgin Mary as mother, but even though my mother died when I was a young girl, I had a stepmother and, and in my perspective, my worldview, I have just really never felt motherless. That's beautiful. Thank you. I think that um, it, I understood where she was coming from to say, sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Her voice was out there and she was saying things and doing things no one else was saying. She was saying that our problem is that some have been taught that black expression is not Catholic, mm -hmm. but this is our mother church. She spoke up against racism. How many of you all have ever spoke up against racism, used the word, and somehow people want to make you feel uncomfortable? It's like when that word comes out, just a weirdness comes across the room. Kathleen, I have a story. Um, years ago, the um, Office of Black Catholics gave out bumper stickers that said something like, Black, Catholic, and proud. Yeah, I don't that know was if you opinion. remember that. I do. That but was our I had opinion. that bumper sticker on my car, and um, someone anonymously, and I'll say, didn't even have the courage to um, address me directly, but they left a note on my car asking me why it was important to be to have black on there asking me why, you know, why, why did I have to um, point out that I was black? Well, they never afforded me an opportunity to answer them because they didn't leave a number or any, any place I could respond to them. But I was thinking, why would they question who I am? You know, that I'm proud to be black, Catholic and proud and I assume it was a white person who left the note that would question, you know, wh why would I want to tell that I'm proud of who I am? And um, I think that's kind of the racism of just not being embraced as the church. You know, we're not, from my perspective, I want to be, um, I'm as much a part of the church as anybody else, but other people don't recognize that because they think they have to um, do things to, to make us fit into their um, mold of what the church looks like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
Very good. For tail? I want to share something with you. Um, I read in a book that was um, written by Father Maurice J. Nutt on Sister Thea Bowman. And she says, what does it mean to be black and Catholic? It means that I come to my church fully functioning. That doesn't frighten you, does it? <laughs> I come to my church fully functioning. I bring myself, my black self, all that I am, all that I have, all that I hope to become. I bring my whole history, my traditions, my experience, my culture, my African-American song and dance and gesture and movement and teaching and preaching and healing and responsibility as gifts to the church. Sister Thea Bowman. Amen. Amen. When I listened to that, and of course I've, I've read it before, but on that movie that came out and we all can identify with that. It was the voice that we had inside that needed to come out. It's all of our voice. Who, y'all agree? I don't know. I bring my black self fully functioning, fully functioning. You always gotta have like something wrong with you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, okay. uh, two participants raised hands. Elise and Vertel, yours is still up. So let's see what's Elise. Um, I think my experiences, and then I listened to um, Sister Thea. I was lucky one of my friends from DC sent the video that's on YouTube. I can just click on it anytime it's on my phone. But I think my experiences because I've been Catholic for so long, I'm almost 80 years old, and I've been Catholic since I was 10 or 11. And we were fortunate to have priests that seemed to understand how to minister to a Black congregation. We weren't mixed. At the time, we were a Black Catholic Church, uh, um, Immaculate Conception, St. Peter's, all Black. But I never felt any way um, not accepted. Maybe that's because of where I am. But I never felt not accepted. I never felt less than. I was in the Catholic Church when they were speaking Latin. So I took Latin in school so I could understand what was going on in Mass. But um, I, I appreciate all the sister there did because she did this during a time when it wasn't popular. She was born in 1937. And we were in the heat of Jim Crow. And she was from, uh, you know, deep south. And to speak out and be the kind of person that she was, was amazing. Absolutely amazing. And I was, because I see she died at 53. She did a lot. And those on those 53 years. And that's Absolutely. what impresses me so much about her. And I think the miracles that are needed were um, created when Sister Thea was alive. She shouldn't need any more miracles. <laughs> she was a miracle in herself. Oh my. And there should not be a reason why we have to now have miracles to say that Sister Thea should be a saint. Sister Thea was born a saint. And she lived a saintly life. So I was just very impressed with the way I worked in the movie industry for a long time. So I was very impressed with the quality of this documentary. I hope, I, mean, I hope everybody who's Catholic, Black, white, or otherwise would see the documentary and learn to appreciate the struggles that she just didn't think, did wasn't afraid, didn't think about the you know, the environment she was in, and she spoke out. And I'm just very impressed with her. Oh, knowing absolutely. that back in the 50s and the 60s, you weren't saying what Sister Thea was saying. Thank mm -hmm. you, Kathleen. 
Well, thank you. And um, in the movie, they talked about how she did live her life. Um, remember the part where, um, I don't remember the guy's name, but he was um, European, um, American, white, and they were friends. I think he was a, a musician. Musician, yes. Yes. And um, she was sitting in the car and he was just talking for such a long time. <laughs> yes. And somebody saw them good. and tried that like they had something going on. They right. said, no, she was a sister and she was a true sister. And she said, and I sit a little she, bit longer. She lived that life. <laughs> yeah, she did. She said, oh, let's just sit a little longer to give her more to talk about. Yes. You yes. know? <laughs> I thought that was very, very good. Well, oh, folks, yes. we have come to the end of our first Friday table talk, one hour, and you're welcome to stay on afterwards, but we're going to let those that need to get back to whatever it is they need to get back to or to start, and we'll have a closing prayer. Uh, Father Michael, if you would like to do that, if you're able, if not, Deacon um, Shambliss can do it. Father Michael? Well, I think he popped off. Okay. So Kathleen, um, and to all of the participants here, as always, this, this is a great way to kick off a month. And uh, I appreciate uh, this session. I personally did not know Sister Bowman. In fact, I uh, sort of cringe when someone tells me that they became Catholic 70 years ago. That's I say congratulations <laughs> because I became Catholic after I was 30 something <laughs> and, and our kids brought us to the church. Um, it, it's such an amazing way that God's hand is uh, involved in our lives. And so I, I will say to all of you that our life has certainly been immensely, uh, immensely graced as we fell into the throes of Catholicism. Um, my wife grew up in the Black Baptist Church. I grew up in the AME Church and our kids brought us to the faith. And uh, it's been an incredible ride ever since. I did know of Thea Bowman, but I did not know her, even though she grew up 30 miles north of Jackson, Mississippi, being an AME. Who is Thea? And I have come to appreciate her life. Uh, mm -hmm. I've met many, many people who knew her. And so her life is uh, immensely impactful for so many of us in so many ways. Uh, you know, in the African American way, but in a female way. And our, tr our church still struggles with female presence and power, bottom line. And in a female way, she was such an outstanding figure of strength, love, and authority. It, her life has totally impressed me. So anyway, with that, I will simply say, in the name of our Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Dear God, we pray for your help for us, for our meager souls here in South Carolina and for all that are on this call, for help that we move across this space of autumn toward the celebration of life this month in October, the celebration of our saints in November and the birth of our Christ in December. Dear God, we ask for your presence as we move through the national politics of keeping us alive and well with so many divergent voices pulling at our hearts over the next few weeks as we face elections. And finally, we thank you for the blessings of this life, for allowing us to experience the glow of Christ as our beacon of hope in this galaxy of your universe. So in the name of Christ, we say, amen. 
Amen.